Hello everyone, this is part two of my summary of the living story so far. Heavily abridged, yet still quite long. It's about 40 minutes in total. On, uh, there should be a link on the screen right now uh, to part one if you've missed it. This is picking up from the beginning of the events of the Dragon Bash up until now. I'm also going to go over at the end of the video a theory to do with Ellen Keel and how she could possibly be evil. It's not my theory, it's a theory I found on the forums but I thought would work really well here after I've recapped everything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. If you haven't seen the first part, link right there and uh, I will guess see you again at the end. <laughs> enjoy everyone. Um, now this Dragon Bash is a festival that everybody's participating in in modern day Tyria, but it's actually inspired by an ancient Canthan festival that you could participate in if you were a Guild Wars 1 player. Now the original Dragon Festival in Guild Wars 1 celebrated dragons and it celebrated the, the nature of the Celestials over in Cantha in that region of the world and it made sense for the humans of that region of the world 250 years ago. Uh, but it doesn't really make sense for modern day Tyria. So instead of being the Dragon Festival it's Dragon Bash and instead of celebrating dragons it's a festival to celebrate Tyria's defiant spirit against the Elder Dragons. That's the idea of it. And in Lion's Arch, everything was decorated and you could see a giant uh, fake, a holographic effigy, a giant dragon that would be flying around and they blew it up one night. And it was this wonderful festival with loads of mini games and things to play. Um, now, there, it, there was minor protest and unrest about the festival uh, amongst Tyrians because they thought, look, this is a really serious issue, the Elder Dragons. They're killing a lot of us. We shouldn't be making light of it. But aside from that and a little bit of lore that they threw in there, a couple of characters that you could speak to who weren't particularly happy with the Dragon Bash, mostly it was quite cut and dry. This is a festival about the dragons. However, the festival was meant to end with a big ceremony uh, involving a dragon effigy and um, a representative of each race that had been harmed by the Elder Dragons would set fire to it. It was going to be this big moment in the festival. Now, just before that happened, just before the ceremony, players got a mail in-game from a mysterious character who tagged the end of the letter with just the letter E in capitals. And this is what the mail said. I want to read these out because this is where it gets quite interesting. Um, just before the ceremony, we got this mysterious mail that said, You may not know me, but I know you. I'm calling you because you're capable in the face of danger. If you consider yourself a force for good in this world, then I implore you to attend the Dragon Bash ceremony in Lion's Arch. I've heard whispers about a threat to the ship's council and, if left unchecked, to the city itself. I'd intervene myself, but circumstances prevent it. I'd wish you luck, but luck is what fools and idiots require to stay alive. You, I believe, are neither. I will surely contact you again. E. Interesting. So that happens and you're implored to be there at the ceremony. Uh, the ceremony goes underway and just at the end, the effigy that everybody's sort of crowding around explodes. It's rigged. It explodes and it injures loads of people in the area and actually kills the Char cultural representative. An investigation immediately begins. Ellen Keel, who's been out on r and immediately comes back forwards. Another investigation. Who the hell is responsible for what just happened? Just after the ceremony, we get another message from our mysterious friend, who says the situation has worsened. One of the Lion's Arch counsellors, Theo Ashford, has succumbed to his wounds. The Lion Guard is keeping the news quiet while the festival continues, but they're overwhelmed trying to maintain security in the area. At this very moment, a killer walks free and this cannot be allowed. Go to Divinity's Reach, to the Eastern Commons. There, in a back alley bar called The Dead End, you'll find one of the best investigative minds in Tyria, Marjorie Delacroix. She'll need your help to find those behind the counsellor's death. Tell her E sent you. Work with her, sift through the clues, and solve the crime. I will surely contact you again. E. And that's the last thing we've ever heard from E. Okay, so a little bit of that that I just read you is specific where you're going in game stuff. But what's interesting is there's this mysterious character that seemed to know what was happening there. And this idea here as well that Theo Ashford had succumbed to his wounds. This is one of the Lion's Arch counsellors. For those of you who don't know, Lion's Arch is ran by essentially two bodies. One of those bodies is the Commodore. Commodore Lawson Mariner, right? He's a big, powerful guy. He's sort of the leader of Lion's Arch. 
Now he splits his duties and his rulership of Lion's Arch with a council of captains who make decisions with him. So we've kind of got these two different bodies that rule over Lion's Arch. One of the people on that council is now dead and that's pretty serious. So he's saying they're trying to keep it hush hush. Whoever's responsible for the attack on Dragon Bash is now responsible for some pretty high level criminal activity. Um, so you head to the dead end as this mysterious E character tells you to um, and just as you get there you get there in time to see Logan Thackeray um, doing exactly what you were about to. He hires Marjorie Delacroix, this new character, this in investigator, um, to discover who was behind the Dragon Bash attack. The reason Logan wants to hire her is because the council member, Theo Ashford, who's just been assassinated, was supposedly one of Logan's long-term friends. I kind of think they just wanted to shoehorn Logan into this bit of the, the living story, but whatever. L Logan hires Marjorie Delacroix. You team up with Marjorie Delacroix to find out who was responsible. Long story short, you discover one of of the women in that very crowd when the effigy blew up was the one behind it all. This is a woman named Mai Trin. She's not just any old person, she is the captain of a new group of people called the Aether Blades. These are Sky Pirates of Tyria. These are people that have banded together on airships and commit piracy, it would seem, but not just petty crimes. Pretty big stuff if they're assassinating people on the Lion's Arch Council. Just as you call her out and find out that she was the culprit, she makes a quick escape and it's your job to hunt her down. At this point, Ellen Keel, very much, she takes the helm again, she's placed in charge of security, and Marjorie Delacroix, who had discovered all this stuff, she kind of steps back again. She's not a part of the next bit of the story, but she steps back because her investigation is over. So, Dragon Bash segues into Sky Pirates of Tyria. This was the next bit of the living story and it was very closely tied to Dragon Bash. Dragon Bash was still going on while all of this Sky Pirates stuff was going on. So now we have this villain, these Sky Pirates. They came very left field, there's not that much lore about them. I sort of felt like they were a bit of a cop-out faction that didn't have much intrigue about them. But they've been a persistent force within the living story going forward. So if you're not too excited about the idea of these Sky Pirates straight away, I will tell you that ArenaNet are pushing the angle quite a lot and they do have a lot more depth as we get further into the living story. Um, so Sky Pirates the Terrier begins, it continues directly on from the Dragon Brash, and it isn't revealed how, but Ellen Keel discovers an Aetherblade base, the Aetherblades being the Sky Pirates, right inside, just outside Lion's Arch, right there, right next to Lion's Arch. Um, and even better, my Trin is in that base. Uh, so the players travel inside with Ellen Keel, where they learn that the Sky Pirates have been funded by the Inquest. The Inquest, I'm pretty sure if you play Guild of Steel, you should know who they are the sort of the evil Asura. There's a lot more to them than that. But the Inquest have been funding the Sky Pirates. This is where they've got all their technology. This is where they've got their airships from. And when you're actually hunting down my train, you see a lot of very complicated and cool looking technology that the Aether Blades have got their hands on. Uh, the, the, the players in Ellen Keel push in and they find my Trin. They confront her and defeat her, a lot like with Kanak. And my Trin too is placed in jail. Um, as you're going through that dungeon though, that new dungeon they added, the second dungeon they added after the Molten Facility, my Trin mentions that Scarlet will not be pleased. Uh, that's all she says. Nothing's known about Scarlet at all, and when you try and press for more questions, she'll just say nothing about her. Just Scarlet will not be pleased. It sounds an awful lot then, like Scarlet could be either one of the Inquest, who are funding whatever the, the Aether Blades have been doing, or it could just be flat out the leader of the Aether Blades. You can also tie that into a lot of the earlier stuff too. Maybe Scarlet was the, the mastermind behind the Molten Alliance. In fact, it says on Wiki, I'm not sure where it got this from, but it says on Wiki, that Theo Ashford didn't necessarily die from that explosion at the ceremony, but he was actually assassinated by the Molten Alliance, that the Molten Alliance, the remnants of it, had something to say about Theo Ashford's death. So that's quite interesting too. Anyway, we hear about this Scarlet character. So now we've got this mysterious E character, someone who'd formed the Molten Alliance and Scarlet too. But with my trim behind bars, uh, essentially peace descends back upon Lion's Arch. The outcome of all of this though is Ellen Keel actually become, is made captain of one of the confiscated Aetherblade airships that they find. They've got loads of air, airships, obviously. They had a whole base worth of them. And Ellen Keel becomes a captain. As a captain, she's actually able to run for that seat on the captain's council. The, the seat that's just opened up, she can run for it. And Captain Magnus the Bloody, once again her longtime friend, convinces her that she should really go for the seat. Um, meanwhile, as well as this was all going on, players could continue to go back to see 
see Braham and Rox in their individual areas. Uh, Rox is training with her new Devourer, which she's named Frostbite. And Braham, you can see he's constantly having, like, he's trying to have a relationship with this Ottilia person. And it eventually comes out that Ottilia just wants to leave and she doesn't want to stay in Cragstead forever. I'll come back to those two characters towards the end of this video. Um, but yeah, so you can go and see what they're doing. And there's lots of other minor things as well always happening with the living story. But I'm trying to give you the meat and bones here. So that segues us into, finally, the most recent two updates for the living story, uh, the Bazaar of the Four Winds and Cutthroat Politics. As the Dragon Bash events sort of settle away, um, something completely unrelated happens. Uh, the Zephyr Sanctum, which is a vast floating air city, uh, arrives in Tyria for the first time in over a decade at least. Um, Lion's Arch Council members have always really wanted to have a trade agreement with the people of the Zephyr Sanctum because they travel all around the world. The Zephyrites are a people basically entirely sustained by trading. They go to exotic areas, they grab stuff, they, they move to a different area of the world and then they have that to trade. Um, the, the Lion's Arch Council members see it as it would be a really good asset to the city if they had this trade agreement, but they've never managed to get one with the Zephyrites. Um, as an idea for a way to impress the council members into letting Ellen Keel have a seat, um, Keel agrees to go to the Zephyrites and win their favour. She thinks, right, I'll get this trade agreement going, and then the council members will see that, yeah, I should definitely be on the council. However, as this plan is concocted, she's overheard by Evan Nashblade. I mentioned him right back near the start of the video. He's the leader of the Black Lion Trading Company, arguably the largest corporation in all of Tyria right now, whose primary competitors are the Consortium. Now, Evan overhears this, and he knows trading. He, he's built his whole life around that. He feels he'd do a better job than Ellen at convincing the Zephyrites to uh, get this trade agreement. He also thinks he deserves a seat on the captain's council. So we have two candidates. Uh, they both go to meet with the Zephyrites and they compete with one another to win the Zephyrites and the players' favour. Only one of them can win, only one of them can end up on the council, and we, the players, kind of help the Zephyrites to determine which person that should be. Uh, we, the players, at this point in the living story, this is the first time it happened, uh, we are able to choose how it continues. If you think about the personal story, one big thing of it is there's loads of decisions you get to make all the time. ArenaNet are doing that for the living story too, but it's sort of en masse. We, the Guild Wars 2 players, the whole community, are shaping the story as it goes. And this was the first little thing we got, which person joins the council. Now, the Zephyrites themselves, I will say, have got a lot of cool lore about them, um, but the living story itself isn't so much about the Zephyrites. I did a whole video on Zephyrites and their connection to Glint, and I think that's very cool and very interesting and a lot of compelling stuff about the living story, but that's actually sort of separate from the, the general story that we seem to be getting pushed here. Now, it's mostly about who's going to be on this council. Now, I also did a whole video about which candidate people might like to choose, but I spent the entire time focusing on the, the fractal that those candidates were going to be adding. See, we didn't just get to pick a member that would join the council and it would only affect the, the story itself. ArenaNet added a load of other stuff in at the same time, like cheaper waypoint costs or cheaper black line keys. And also, we would get one specific fractal depending on which candidate we chose. I did a whole video about the fractal, but the story itself, there's a lot of compelling differences between these two candidates that you had to decide between. Ellen Keel, of course, seems like the more upstanding citizen and probably the good person's choice. Uh, but then at the same time, she's primarily a soldier. You know, she was just a member of the Lion's Guard for uh, until very, very recently. She's had a lot of very rapid promotions here. She is sort of just a soldier, just uh, a guard, really. Would she really be that great behind a desk? You know, that's one big question people had to ask themselves when choosing which character should be nominated. Uh, Evan Nashblade, by contrast, lives behind a desk, right? He, he, he's the leader of a large company. He knows this stuff. He knows paperwork presumably. He knows what it means to be a member of the Captain's Council. But Evan's not the greatest guy out there. You know, he could just want to further his own agendas and not necessarily the good of Lion's Arch. People had to know that kind of thing. Like, it was a, a pretty interesting idea, I think. Um, that could be a good thing, though, that he just wanted to further his own agendas, I will say, because... If the Consortium spring up again as an issue, uh, which candidate is much more likely to do something about it? Okay, the Consortium are obviously a big part of the living story. I do think they'll come back. Uh, who's going to deal with this better? Ellen Keel, who at the end of the day arrested Kanak just because the law's the law, and Kanak was like stoically against the Consortium. 
Or is Nashblade more likely to do something about it? Nashblade, I think out of any character in the entire Guild Wars universe right now, is the one with the most motivation, except perhaps Kanuk, with the most motivation to fight against the Consortium. Those are some of the only people in competition with his business. I think, you know, if Nashblade was made on the council, I, it wouldn't be surprising to see he frees Kanak and says, no, look, Kanak, you were just fighting against the Consortium here, you can go free. There were a lot of questions, this is what I'm saying. Some people might have voted, you know, not even based necessarily on the story, but just because they don't like Ellen Keel and they don't want her to be promoted. Or maybe you don't like Ellen Keel, so you do vote for her, because you know then she'll be on the council, Captain's Council and she won't be in any more living story stuff, potentially. Maybe you think Evan Nashblade will be bad for Lion's Arch, but you still want to vote for him because you just want to see him cause chaos. It was cool. That's all I'm saying, and I, I, I think we're definitely going to see more stuff like this from the living story going forward. Now... The outcome of that election happened, what, two days ago from when I'm recording this? Possibly four days ago by the time it gets uploaded. The, well, the results are now in. You guys, I'm putting out this video, you don't get to vote. So if you're only just hearing about this, it, it's over now. The character that won the election was Ellen Keel. You could put that down to, oh, hey, she's a character we spent a lot of time with actually in-game. Players liked her. They thought that she'd be the better choice. She was the moral choice for Lion's Arch. But also you can put that down to the fact that more people wanted cheaper waypoints rather than Black Lion Keys because people only care about gold in this game. Nobody's really focusing on the, the, the story except for a few of us. Us. Um, and it, it was really just that, that Ellen Keel won it alone on that. Um, but regardless, Ellen Keel is now on the ship's council. That could mean a lot of stuff for the living story. Uh, there's one really particularly interesting theory. I was going to do a Guild Wars 2 Mysteries on it, uh, but when I was working on the Mysteries, I thought, hey, I've just got to explain basically a lot of the living story stuff. So I thought I'd do this recap on the total story so far. Uh, so I will throw it in there just for a second. There, there's a pretty interesting theory that I read on the thought forums that Ellen Keel is the this scarlet person of the Aether Blades. Okay, E, who sent us that really mysterious message, E is Evan Nashblade. Um, uh, while he looks rough around the edges, maybe E is Evan Nashblade, E for Evan. I mean, he actually does have Lion's Arch's best interests at heart. If you look at Ellen and what she was doing around the Aetherblade stuff, she, she knew straight away where their base was in Lion's Arch, and it was never fully explained how she knew how to do that. Once we were in there, she knew how to operate all of their mysterious, weird machinery. She was really keen to destroy any survivors that might have outed her once they got away. They got rid of her airship. It was the fall of the Aether Blades that gave her her airship. It was the Aether Blades who had opened up the seat on the council in the first place. And one of the things Ellen Keel was promising to do for us once she became one of the captain's council was to fund research for a fractal of the mists about the inquest. The inquest who have been funding all of the Aether Blade stuff. So maybe she that, that's her motivation. Maybe this was all just to get her on the council because she's one of the Aether Blades. She she's now got this great position on the council with an Aether Blade airship under her control. She can fund research into the big inquest mystery that happened at Thormanova. And the inquest that are funding the Aether Blades might now know what they need to know. Anyway, that's just a theory. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that can happen, but regardless, Ellen is in the council. She could have been the bad choice, but it doesn't matter now. She's in, and we get to see what happens. Uh, the election's over. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean she can do a whole lot. She's one member of a council which, as a whole, then splits its management of Lion's Arch with Commodore, Lawson, Mariner. But still, it, it's interesting stuff. Uh, that's you guys up to date with the living story. That's that's what's going on. I said I'd mention Braham and Rox again at the end. And that's what I'm going to do now. The next chapter of the living story, which is live in Guild Wars 2 now. It came out the day that I'm recording this, just a few hours ago. Um, um, it's about, it takes place not in Lion's Arch, it now takes place in Divinity's Reach. It's the Queen's Jubilee. Do you remember the Great Collapse, everyone? That giant district of the city that had a massive hole in it? That, during some earlier Living Story updates, which I haven't mentioned, as I said, there's loads of little things that are constantly happening. Um, that actually what began to be repaired a couple of weeks ago, and now it is fully repaired. We've got an entirely new district in Divinity's Reach. Um, there's obviously loads of other updates that have been going in the game, not related to the Living Story, but to do with rewards and stuff. But uh, the Jubilee is currently going on. Uh, we'll be seeing Logan Thackeray We'll be seeing Braham and Rox are returning for this update. I'm not going to spoil what happens. Uh, in two weeks when the next update comes out, I'll do a recap on this current one that's come out. And maybe then when I've got less raw information to go through, I can do more speculation about where I think it's going to go for you guys as well. Uh, but that's the living story, everybody. That's what's happening. That's everything you need to know. Hopefully here you can see as well, there is sort of a long narrative, but it's coming out in small chunks. Like, you could have gone and experienced the Jubilee without listening to me say all of this, to be perfectly honest. But now you do have that greater appreciation 
appreciation for everything that else is happening. When you do see Bra Braham or rocks when you go in there, you will know, oh, this is where they're from. Or if there's any references to the Molten Alliance, you'll know. If there's any references to the Carcass stuff, to Ellen Keel being on the council, this is all stuff we the players saw and got to interact with. Um, and there you go. I will continue this as not necessarily a series of its own, but there will be videos coming out each time there's a new update. Uh, and we're all sort of up to date on the channel here too. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Um, it's sort of my completionist mentality again. I want to have it sort of all there out online. So there you go. That's uh, a recap of the living story. There is a link in the description to a fantastic resource, which I used extensively to create this video on the wiki that like outlines everything that happened for the living story. I know it's quite, it, for me, it was kind of fuzzy. A lot of the carcass stuff that happened, that really set it straight for me. And it's really, really useful. If you want to be able to read it in text form, uh, then it will be down there. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Um, I hope you've been enjoying it and I will see you next time.